Now, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to clear, or begin by, by stating that there is a clear sense that Canada's news environment has changed dramatically, and it's changed significantly, especially in the last 10 and 20 years. The Internet has changed how we do business. It has brought many changes to all aspects of our lives, our communities, and how businesses operate. And these changes as they've happened, as these disruptions have happened in the digital marketplace, they've had a very specific impact on the media industry, and in particular, the traditional print media industry. As many Canadians know, the cumulative advertising dollars that are spent in Canada are now more and more being spent on online means. As these dollars move online, a smaller and smaller number of dollars are being spent on traditional advertising, on print advertising, that for years, for decades, has been used to sustain the news industry. Newsrooms in 2022 are far smaller today than they were even a decade ago. Comp contrast that even further back to 20 and 30 years ago when many of these newsrooms that now are operating with one or two journalists at one point operated with a dozen. Now, Mr. Speaker, I know you have a background in the media industry and will be able to reflect on this ch these changes that have happened over these number of years. Still, other newsrooms have closed entirely. And when these newsrooms close, they leave in their wake deserts, news deserts, in which parts of a community, or in some cases, entire communities are left without access to reliable local news sources. And these closures have particularly hurt small town and rural communities, like those communities in many of our ridings. Canadians rely on local news. They rely on local news to inform their lives and help their, inform their decision-making at the local, regional, and national levels. Whether it be the members of the parliamentary press gallery, the press galleries of the provincial legislatures, or countless individual journalists who cover the goings-on at city halls and town halls and communities across our country, all of these journalists have a role to play in Canada's democratic life. In fact, Mr. Speaker, a free and independent press is essential to a functioning democracy. I would draw the House's attention to one of the famous comments on a free and independent press from George Mason, one of the American founding fathers. He said, quote, the freedom of the press is one of the greatest bulwarks of liberty and cannot and can never be restrained by despotic governments." End quote. Mr. Speaker, that quotation is as true then as it is now. The freedom and the ability to, for the press to fairly, impartially, and honestly report the news to citizens of this country is absolutely essential. Mr. Speaker, that local news is struggling is not in doubt. The traditional business model that saw print publications sell advertising space in hard copy publications worked for de decades and saw successes. Small independent newspapers and large media empires alike relied on the basic practice of using this advertising space to reach the eyes of readers and help sustain their newsrooms. Now, in 2022, while the advertising model has diminished, what has not diminished is the continued need for impartial, honest, and trustworthy sources of news. Now, the government itself has admitted that they have not yet found a solution to this problem. In fact, in his press conference after introducing this bill, the Minister of Canadian Heritage himself conceded that a significant number of news providers have closed their doors in recent years during their time in office. This is not only unfortunate, it is also a weakening of our communities. Local newspapers, radio stations, and television stations bring us the stories that impact us in our daily lives. At the local level, 
They report the stories of a community. They cover municipal councils, charitable events and fundraisers, community festivals and fall fairs, and the success of our local sports teams, or in some cases, the hopes for future success for these teams. Local journalism also covers the more unfortunate, but nonetheless essential stories that need to be told in our communities. Stories of crime, fires, floods, and violence. As I drive across the 3,500 square kilometers of Perth Wellington, I find myself flipping through my car radio's preset stations. And I want to clarify, Madam, Mr. Speaker, that I do use the radio in my car. I don't use Spotify. I don't use uh, satellite radio. I, I prefer traditional radio uh, as I'm driving. And I do that as I drive across uh, from my riding, across my riding, and from here to Ottawa, listening to uh, local stations as, we, as I drive along the, the 401 or, or Highway 7, depending which, uh, which direction I'm taking. And it gives you the opportunity to hear what's going on in communities, not only my own communities in Perth, Wellington, uh, but across the country. But as I drive through Perth and Wellington counties, I find myself flipping to the river. The river is a non-profit entity out of Mount Forest, Ontario, that celebrates everything local, everything important to the community. I often switch to uh, a number of the Blackburn radio stations that are present throughout southwestern Ontario and the important services and the news they provide. In, in fact, one of the Blackburn stations is AM 920 out of Wingham. And I fondly remember as a, as a child listening to AM 920 and, and being shushed by my mother uh, every time the in memoriams came on because, you know, certainly you don't want to miss those. And uh, to this day, that is still part of the station. In Listowel and North Perth, we can tune into The Ranch, the newest entrant to the news and radio market that has quickly found an important spot in the media landscape in Listowel and North Perth and indeed the northern part of Perth County. And of course in Stratford, we can tune into Today FM or Juice FM and hear Jamie Cottle in the morning and before him the local legend Eddie Matthews. And Mr. Speaker, I, I would like to highlight the fact that the radio predecessor to Today FM and Juice FM was AM 1240 CJCS. And Mr. Speaker, it was in 1945 that the CJCS commentators were providing coverage of the Perth Regiment's return from World War II. That coverage, that coverage on AM 1240 CJCS inspired a young 12-year-old boy from Stratford to begin a lifelong career in broadcasting. That young boy began working at CJCS as a high school student. And while he got his start in radio, generations of Canadians know him for his television career as Canada's most trusted news anchor. But Stratford and Perth County will always lay claim to the fact that Lloyd Robertson got his start in our little community on the radio. In Perth County, we also have a number of tremendous local newspapers. In Wellington County, we are lucky to have the Wellington Advertiser, which has proudly served the people of Wellington County for more than half a century. They have been recognized for their work on multiple occasions, including being named the top community newspaper in Ontario in its class by the Ontario Community Newspapers Association. When I attended the 50th anniversary celebration for the Wellington Advertiser, I was struck by a story told by Dave Adset, publisher of the Advertiser. He recounted how his father, Bill Adset, the founder of the Wellington Advertiser, had once had the option to save money by removing delivery to a small portion of Wellington County. But he refused to do so out of principle out of principle to ensure that every citizen in Wellington County had access to the news and information contained in the Wellington Advertiser. When Bill Adset passed away on October 5, 2021, he was rightly remembered and honoured for his lifetime of contributions to the County of Wellington. And in my hometown of Mitchell, I've been a reader of the Mitchell Advocate since literally I was able to read, and I, and I say that completely honestly. And throughout all those years I, that I've been reading the newspaper, Andy Bader has been working hard to bring the news and our local stories to us each and every week. Similarly, I have wonderful memories of reading the Stratford Beacon Herald, 
and watching as photographers like Scott Wishart chronicled the life of the community through his photos, or Steve Rice recording the rise and fall of any number of local sports teams. Unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, many news, many local news providers have closed in the past number of years, hurting communities across Canada, including those in Perth, Wellington. The Mount Forest Confederate, a paper that was first published in the year of Canada's Confederation in 1867, closed. The Arthur Enterprise News, founded before Confederation in 1862, closed. The Minto Express in 2019 was closed. Also in Perth County, many of my constituents were shocked in 2017 when the major media giants shut down abruptly both the St. Mary's Journal Argus and the Stratford Gazette. The closure of the St. Mary's Journal Argus was especially difficult because after 154 years as a newspaper serving the community, they were unexpectedly shut down in one single day without even the opportunity to deliver a final edition to the town's faithful readers. Now, fortunately for the town of St. Mary's, the St. Mary's Independent, led by Stuart Grant, has stepped in to fill that void. And I might add that he does so as a true public service to the community of St. Mary's, Perth South, and beyond. While these examples are certainly local to my riding, the challenges are certainly national in scope. And today's debate is not the first time the issue of struggling local news providers has been raised. In fact, at the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage, we have undertaken a study of the Rogers-Shaw deal and the impact that it will have on local news. This study was initiated, initiated at the, by my friend and colleague, the member from Saskatoon, Grasswood, who himself is a former broadcaster and who himself has prided himself during his broadcasting career delivering local news to his communities in, Sask in Saskatoon and beyond. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, like many Canadians, was disappointed to see the CRTC make a ruling to approve the sale based on certain conditions. Now, obviously, recent events involving the Competition Bureau, Bureau may alter the future of this deal. But what I found interesting and, frankly, disappointing about the Roger Shaw decision by the CRTC was their use of wishy-washy, non-committal language. In their report, in their decision, they use words like encouragement, expectations, and reminders rather than C the CRTC actually taking a real stand. Now, setting aside for a moment CRTC's decision on Roger Shaw, there's no question that the decisions that are made by the CRTC and other entities will have an impact on local news. And it can be questioned as whether the CRTC has the capacity or the competency to actually make decisions that will improve the media landscape in Canada. And that brings me to some of the concerns that we have with the bill at hand. Now, in the last election, there was a general consensus between the different political platforms that something should be done to help local news and journalism survive. Now, in our Conservative platform, under our former leader, the member for Durham, we committed the following. Canada's Conservatives will introduce a digital media royalty framework to ensure that Canadian media outlets are fairly compensated for the sharing of their content by platforms like Google and Facebook. It will adopt a Made in Canada approach that incorporates the best practices of jurisdictions like Australia and France, include a robust arbitration process and the creation of an intellectual property right for article extracts shared on a social media platform, ensure that smaller media outlets are included and the government won't be able to pick and choose who has access to the royalty framework. So, Mr. Speaker, that is what we committed to in the last election campaign. Now, it may surprise you, Mr. Speaker, but we did not win that election. We, uh, we, we came close, certainly, and we did win the popular vote, but we did not form government. To, to, the, great, uh, to the great disappointment of, uh, of my friends uh, on the other side of the House. 
So while we didn't get to draft this legislation, it is our duty as Her Majesty's loyal opposition to review the legislation introduced by the Liberal government and provide the comments that our citizens, our constituents, require of us. Let me say very clearly that Canada's Conservatives believe that news providers should be fairly compensated for the use of their content. That said, we do have questions about this particular piece of legislation. Now, Mr. Speaker, as I explained earlier, local news providers are struggling. This begs the obvious question as to whether C-18 will help the newspapers and radios, radio stations in communities like Perth Wellington, Sarnia Lambton, Elgin Middlesex London, and other rural communities and small town communities across our country. Unfortunately, that is unclear. A recent report from the Toronto Star, itself a long and distinguished media provider in this country, indicated that the Australian model on which this legislation is based may be leaving out small and medium-sized businesses. The article states, quote, but while major publishers and networks in Australia had struck deals with Facebook and Google, some smaller independent outlets were finding themselves shut out from making deals of their own, end quote. The article goes on to quote Aaron Miller, the CEO of IndieGraph, who states, quote, if we're going to have this bill, how are we to design it in such a way that it doesn't lead to the same outcomes as Australia, which is, from my perspective, really not supporting journalism? And there are other questions that remain unanswered with this bill as well, such as why the CRTC was selected as a regulatory body to enforce and oversee the Act when the CRTC does not have a history or experience in regulating online platforms. Let's not forget that the CRTC is the same entity whose chair met privately for beers with one of the largest uh, industries that they regulate. But beyond the chair's clear lack of judgment, let's remember the CRTC has still not implemented a three-digit suicide prevention hotline more than 500 days after this House unanimously passed a motion calling for such a resource. And it's been more than 16 months since the CRTC held hearings about the license renewal for the CBC licenses. If the CRTC cannot make a decision within 16 months on what I would assume to be a fairly routine renewal, how in the world can they have the capacity and competency to do anything that would be new uh, uh, that is asked of them? We also have no indication on how much revenue will be generated when this bill is enforced. Budget 2022 earmarks $8.5 million for the bureaucracy necessary to administer C-18. So it is logical to ask whether the revenues generated through this bill will be greater than or less than the costs to administer it. Mr. Speaker, I know I've got about a minute left, give or take. Um, we have a number of other questions, including how the Code of Conduct will be developed and whether it will be tabled before Parliament. We have questions about what undue preference, uh, preference will be considered as within the, the bill. Will non-Canadian news providers be able to benefit from the Canadian system? Why has the government not tabled a charter statement on this bill? Why was a public broadcaster included when they already receive other entities? Now, Mr. Speaker, while I'm on my feet, we have these questions, and as such, I think an important committee study ought to be had. So I move, seconded by the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London, that the motion be amended by deleting all the words after the word that and substituting the following. Bill C-18, an act respecting online communications platforms that make news content available to persons in Canada, be not now read a second time, but the order be discharged, the bill withdrawn, and the subject matter thereof referred to the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you.